three, any noxious stimuli that is applied to the cervical spine below C3 tends to refer the pain in the posterior shoulder region in the downward direction. So there seemed to be that very nice delineation, demarcation at C3 as far as the direction of the referred pain. So the common symptoms that we find with people with uh, cervicogenic headaches would be that the headache is typically non-continuous. It's typically unilateral, and it may be a combination of headaches as well as neck pain, the headache being referred pain from the neck region. Typically, the headache will start in the posterior region of the neck and ex eventually ex expand to the occipital to the temporal area. And what is key here is that those headaches, sh there should be an association between the occurrence of the headache and also neck pain or neck position or neck posture. So when you do the history on those individuals, there should be some kind of relationship that you're able to determine between um, neck movement, posture, and also the presence and the occurrence of those headaches. As I just mentioned, what is key in that population will be your, your skill assessing and treating the upper cervical spine. This is your origin of the nociception. So this should be, if there is one take home message to take with cervical genic headache is that the issue should be related to the upper cervical spine. So you need to do a thorough evaluation of range of motion and segmental mobility of occiput C1, C1, C2, C2, C3. And we know from the work of Toby Hall in Perth, Australia, that he has identified C1, C2 range of motion restriction as being particularly related to the presence of cervical genic headache with the loss of rotation of 10 to 15 degrees being a good indicator um, for cervical genic headache. And that assessment of C1, C2 rotation is done with the cervical flexion rotation test as is demonstrated um, over here. So, but keep in mind, it's not just C1, C2. So keep in mind that you also want to look at occiput C1. It's not just rotation. Also look at side bending and flexion of the upper cervical spine when you do your assessment. You also may expect reproduction of those headaches with um, your assessment of the upper cervical spine, either through palpation or your passive intervertebral motion. And then although not, <clears throat> although not directly responsible for the nociception, individuals with cervical genic headaches oftentimes have poor posture. And therefore they will oftentimes have poor uh, strength of the deep neck flexors and also of the scapular musculature which is important to address in addition to the upper cervical spine. So our intervention in these individuals, uh, like for all uh, four categories will be to provide advice on staying active within their pain limitation. And um, it should be more than just saying, than telling the patient to remain active. What it is, is basically your role is to understand what the patient needs to do, the activities that they're doing, how their neck pain is in affect, affecting those activities, and then to problem solve with them. What are aspects of their posture? What are aspects of their work that they can change to minimize the amount of pain that they have, but maximize their function? So it's more than just saying to be active. It's really problem solving with the patient. Then your therapeutic exercise should, again, the primary focus should be on the upper cervical spine, trying to return a range of motion to the best of our ability to the upper cervical spine. And this should be complemented by additional exercise to the lower cervical spine and the scapulothoracic musculature as is needed based on your identification of impairments. So while our treatment should focus on the upper cervical spine as the source of nociception, because of the poor posture that many of those individuals will have, we do want to be a little bit more global in our approach. So we do want to address the deep neck flexors, the multifidi, the scapular musculature, and also their posture. But make sure to understand that the source of nociception is the upper cervical spine 
and that should be a primary focus of treatment. Everything else are additional treatment based on your identification of impairments. And the same thing holds through for manual therapy. So if you have good manual therapy skills, there is an endless number of techniques that can be used for the upper cervical spine. So that should be your primary focus of treatment. And then as needed, address the lower cervical spine and the upper thoracic region. There are a large number of studies that shows the effectiveness of uh, physical therapy intervention for people with cervical genic headache this study here by Gwen Jall is the hallmark of those studies. It is the first study that was done on that population, was a very nicely done randomized controlled trial, um, still a, um, an example of how to do a good uh, randomized controlled trial. And she showed that we can be very effective uh, treating people with cervical genic headaches. And we can be very effective within a short amount of time. We should expect people to make progress within two weeks and certainly within four to six weeks, we should expect those individuals to make a tremendous amount of improvement. I, I did not want to leave cervical genic headache just there by themselves. So I feel a little bit compelled to talk about tension types headaches. Um, because we need to be able to differentiate them. The tension type headaches are much more common than cervical genic headaches. And the exact mechanism is not known. But the features is that it's more bilateral in nature. It's more in the frontal area of, uh, of the cranium. And it has a pressing or a tightening kind of quality to it. And it's not associated with physical activities. And it is different than migraine headache because you don't have the nausea or the vomiting or the sensitivity to light or the sensitivity to sound. Um, there's a lot of studies that have been done on that population that have shown that physical therapy, while may be able to provide some improvement, um, the improvement is more limited. So basically, in the type of physical therapy um, interventions that would be best for those people who are typically addressing the musculoskeletal system. So your soft tissue work, your trigger point, dry needling kind of work. But uh, don't expect that population to be as responsive to physical therapy as people with cervical genic headache. So we can try to help those people, but we're, we may not be the magic solution for them. And then the next group that we may encounter are people with migraine headaches. Those are the people that have a vascular source origin of their headaches. Um, those are the people with nausea, vomiting, sensitivity to noise, sensitivity to sound. And by and large, uh, it's been shown that physical therapy probably doesn't have much of an impact on the migraine headaches themselves. But it's also known that people with migraine headaches tend to have a lot of neck pain. And it's been shown that we can be effective treating neck pain on, in that population. So for your migraine headache population, um, just realize that our effectiveness is probably more in treating their neck than the migraine themselves. I also want to mention that headaches can be a red flag. So when we start thinking about treating headache in physical therapy, we do have to make sure that those are cervical genic headaches or tension type headaches that we feel comfortable to treat. Um, but we also have to realize that uh, headaches are red flags for many conditions, um, especially if it's your first or worst headache, that would be something to be concerned about. Um, especially if you have a new onset of headache after 50 years old, or if you have a history of cancer, or if you're immunodeficient, which, which implies that you have more chance for infection. If you have a change in mental status, fever, change in neurological uh, status, all of those things are indication of potential red flags. So just make sure that if you're treating people for their headaches, that it is the appropriate headache that you're treating as defined by cervical genic headaches or tension type headaches. 
If you're keen on, on looking at uh, headaches, um, the International Headache Society has a very uh, good website with a lot of documentation on all the various types of headaches and so on. So this ends the, the first group. So the first group are people who have headaches, tend to be in the occiput area, tends to be in the temporal area associated with neck pain. It's a group that most of their source of nociception should be the upper cervical spine. And that's a group that we expect to be very successful to treat and have success relatively quickly. Within a couple of weeks, we, so we should see some good changes. And certainly within six weeks, we should see uh, very good effectiveness of what we have to provide as physical therapist. So I always tell my student that this is a group that you should expect success. You should expect to be um, successful for those patients. So the next group is neck pain with radiating pain, which is a ridiculous type of pain. This is a group that has a wide spectrum in terms of severity and irritability. So this is uh, the difference here compared to some of the other condition is that with radiating pain or radicular pain, you can have people from minimal amount of pain in the upper extremity to people with very significant deficits in terms of strength and sensory function. Therefore, very wide spectrum in terms of the complexity of the treatment and also the time for recovery that these people will need. So the neck pain with radiating pain is defined as someone who has pain and neurological symptoms like tingling and potentially neurological signs like numbness and weakness and positive neurodynamic tests that is attributed to irritation or compression of the nerve root in the foramen. The term itself just means that there's something irritating or compressing the nerve root, regardless of that condition. Now in the middle age population, we may expect that it would be a bulging of the disc. In the older population, we may expect that it is osteophyte formation due to osteoarthritic kind of changes. At all ages, it could also be just purely inflammation and swelling, especially if you have people with a recent whiplash injury, acute trauma to the neck, they may have radicular signs and symptoms that are related maybe to swelling in the area and not necessarily a disc protrusion or um, osteophyte formation. So this may explain why some group take longer to recover than others because the cause may be a little bit different, keeping in mind that inflammation is probably prevalent in a lot of those people with radicular kind of pain. So the severity, as I mentioned, will vary tremendously from just a little bit of pain to potentially some significant sensory and motor loss. So the common symptoms we expect in this group would be neck pain, with radiating pain, and radiating pain here is illustrated in blue, which tend to be more specific to a dermatome region associated with that nerve root. And also the person may feel that they have perceived uh, paresthesia. They feel that they have a little numbness. They feel like they don't have as good sensation or motor function. Now it's important to understand that people with radicular pain, which is in blue here, oftentimes also have posterior shoulder pain, which is not radicular pain. Uh, that posterior shoulder pain is referred pain. And this is a very nice study that was done to demonstrate that. So if we look at C4, C5, 5, 6, 6, 7, uh, those individuals, what they did, they inserted a needle and basically did a method that's called discography that's uh, basically uh, creating nociception of the disc and look where the pain was. And nociception from the disc itself would be in the posterior shoulder region. So when you see somebody with uh, radicular pain, especially in the middle age population, probably more of a disc related pathology, oftentimes they also have very severe posterior shoulder pain that is referred in nature and the radicular pain is down the arm. So we need to make sure we make the differentiated differentiation between those two types of pain and locations. 
So what is very nice with um, this reticular group is that we have a set of four tests that allow us to rule in or rule out the condition. So to rule in the condition, you would use tests like the positive Sperling A test, which is illustrated here. And a positive test would be reproduction or worsening of the symptoms, the signs and symptoms down the upper extremity. The second test is the upper limb neurodynamic tension test for the median nerve. Same idea, a positive test would be reproduction of the symptoms in the upper extremity. The third test is your cervical distraction test. And in this case, a positive test is actually relief of the symptoms down the upper extremity. And then finally, uh, a positive test would be that the person is unable to rotate more than 60 degrees in the ipsilateral rotation. And that is because when we turn our head to the right, let's say that is the affected side, um, the mechanics of the cervical spine means that that foramen on that side is reduced in size, and that may be why you have that limitation of motion. If you have three or four of those, you have 65% probability of cervical radiculopathy. If you have all four, that probability goes up to 90%. What is also very useful is that if you have a negative, a negative upper limb neurodynamic test, it pretty much rules out radiculopathy. So that, um, you know, this may be the test that you start with if you don't have a lot of indication or you just want to rule out radiculopathy and you want to be efficient, you may want to start with that test. And if it is negative, it pretty much rules out the condition and may make some of those other tests not very uh, needed for you to do. In addition to this, though, you really want to do a good uh, neurological exam. So your sensory exam, your strength exam, and also your deep tendon reflexes realizing that the more severe the condition, the more likely you will have sensory loss, motor loss, and deep tendon reflex uh, loss. But this is the beauty of those four tests is that this group of four tests here allows you to make the diagnosis of radiculopathy on people with maybe just light to moderate symptoms. Um, as the symptoms get more severe and you start having uh, sensory loss, motor loss that corresponds to a specific nerve root, then the diagnosis becomes quite easy to do. So remember again that when we talk about radiculopathy, we have a full spectrum from just a little bit of irritation that can produce pain to compression where you're now having your sensory and motor loss. So quite a few wide spectrum in terms of the uh, intensity of the findings and also uh, maybe the time for recovery and the complexity, the fine tuning of your treatment to uh, recover for those people. So in terms of intervention, again, we want to maintain those people as active as possible. Uh, again, it's more than just telling them to stay active. It's really problem solving, understanding when they have issues and trying to um, understand how what we can do um, in individuals where they have a, a very that are more severe that are more irritable and that really truly have a lot of radicular signs and symptoms we may have to provide them advice on regular um, rest periods during the day Ideally, that would be basically being non-weight bearing, so lying down with the head supported, that may be enough to reduce their symptoms. If that is not enough, we may need to instruct them, teach them to open the foramen a little bit while they're lying down, which means a little bit of flexion, a little bit of side bending away, not too much, just enough to relieve their symptoms, and then stay in that position for several minutes and up to 20 minutes with the idea that we're trying to keep the nerve root healthy, allowing better blood supply to the nerve root while we're trying to, um, to change the, uh, the situation here as we, we address the source of that uh, compression. Um, in individuals who cannot lay down, another approach that may be useful is supporting the shoulder. Um, because when we're in a sitting posture or standing posture, the weight of our upper extremity creates a little bit of traction on the brachial plexus. 
So just supporting the shoulder, somebody works at a computer or desk station, providing support that elevates the shoulder may provide a little bit of relief on the brachial plexus tension and may be very useful to reduce their pain and discomfort. It's not meant to be a permanent solution, but meant to be able to uh, accommodate when the person is uh, in a more severe stage early on. Then most of the studies that have looked at providing treatment for that population have used a combination of treatment. So in terms of therapeutic exercises, oftentimes it includes working on the deep neck flexors. And working on the deep neck flexors has two benefits. First of all, it keeps that musculature healthy or improve if it is weak. But the other reason to do that is that it promotes retraction of the cervical spine. And for the cervical spine, retraction is often looked a little bit like extension exercise, the McKenzie extension exercises for the lumbar spine. So we want to try to promote that retraction of the cervical spine, but realize that for people in the early stages, more severe condition, that retraction may be very difficult to do because it may cause a lot of pain. So you have to be progressive in how you do that retraction in the early stages. And then you can also address the scapular musculature as, as needed. Um, most of those studies have also used thoracic spine thrust manipulation as part of the intervention in the early stages. And uh, so while uh, we're trying to kind of quiet down the cervical region, using thrust manipulation for the thoracic spine may have the benefit of the neurophysiological effect of thrust manipulation. So we know that thrust manipulation is not just a mechanical effect, there's a lot of neurophysiological effects. So manipulating that region may help with control of pain. And that's been part of most of the interventions offered to that population. Later on, as the more severe symptoms are reduced and maybe there's just some residual symptoms in the upper extremity, techniques like lateral glide techniques for the cervical spine, especially if done in this neurodynamic position here can be quite useful, especially if we think that there may be some need for motion between the articular structures and the nerve. You place the nerve under tension here and you basically move the neck in relationship to the nerve, uh, maybe freeing up, uh, creating a little bit of circulation in the area and maybe potentially freeing up a little bit of adhesions if that is the case in the area. So kind of a nice trick, but not to be done typically in the early stages, much later on when somebody has just maybe some residual pain or um, other symptoms down the upper extremity. <coughs> One intervention also uh, used by all those studies that address radiculopathy is intermittent mechanical traction and typically done following those uh, those um, details here, typically for about 15 minutes, typically with the spine and a little bit of flexion. The whole time, the traction time should be 20 to 30 seconds with a 10 seconds relaxation time in between. Typically, um, the uh, traction force will be somewhere between eight and 10 kilograms. It should be enough to relieve the symptoms in the upper extremity. And then the off time is not completely off. You should leave a little bit of tension, the traction, so that it's about a half or so of what you apply during the maximum traction force. So maybe about five kilos. And there's been a nice um, recent uh, random um, literature review that has shown that um, when they compared studies, studies treating people with cervical radiculopathy that use cervical traction versus did not use cervical traction. And by and large, they found that either manual traction or mechanical traction had an overall benefit to pro the provision of physical therapy. So you should look at cervical traction as maybe being the most, uh, I don't wanna say most important, but one of the important interventions to do in that group to improve your outcome. Uh, the use of uh, cervical, soft cervical collars, as we see here, that's debated a lot. So there are a lot of clinicians who would say never use that. 
I'm not in that camp. I, I have good, I've had good success with this clinically to have patients with what I thought was very severe, irritable radiculopathy to wear a soft cervical collar. But I would have them wear it more as needed during the day if they needed to be spending more time on the computer, so for comfort, but also trying not to be using it for a long period of time, maybe just for a few days, maybe two weeks at the most, but again, not all the time or in an intermittent manner. So a little controversial, but even the clinical practice guideline indicates that uh, it may be useful in the acute, more severe stage. And then additional things like electrophysical agents can be used as uh, need as you feel needed, but it shouldn't be um, the most important thing you do with that population. So the group uh, with radiating pain, um, I think what we have is a very good diagnostic criteria for that group. So we should be able to quite readily identify people who have radiculopathy based on their signs and symptoms, based on those four tests that I mentioned, as well as a good neurological exam. We have a pretty good set of intervention that we expect would work on that population, which includes um, cervical uh, traction in addition to thrust manipulation for the thoracic spine and potentially also some deep neck flexors and, and a retraction exercise for the cervical spine. As I mentioned though, this, this is a very wide spectrum of severity. Therefore, expect some of those people to respond very well, very quickly, but do expect some people to take longer to respond and have to be managed a little bit more progressively um, over a longer period of time. So the next group to um, talk about is neck pain with mobility deficits. And um, this group, uh, pretty straightforward from the naming here, we would expect them to have um, pain in the central part of the neck or unilateral part, unilateral neck pain. And we expect them to have a limitation in neck motion. And the key here is that that limited neck motion consistently reproduces their symptoms. And again, the symptoms can be localized to the neck, but remember that all the structures um, from C3 down, ligaments, uh, muscular structures, and disc structures all refer pain to the posterior shoulder region. So we may also see some of those individuals having pain in that posterior shoulder region due to that referral uh, of uh, pain perception. Our expected examination finding will be limited cervical active and an passive range of motion. And note here that when we look at the cervical spine, we like to include T1 to T4 because we know that mechanically this region here needs to move when you move your cervical spine. So when you're thinking of evaluating range of motion for the cervical spine, make sure you include that upper thoracic region, uh, T1 to T4 as part of the, the mechanics of the region. And then we would expect them to have restricted cervical and thoracic segmental mobility when you do your passive intervertebral motion testing as you see here. And if you're skilled with manual therapy technique, you may recognize limitation that are consistent with a down glide limitation or an up glide limitation that fits the restriction of range of motion that you observe with active and passive range of motion. We may also expect that we have um, neck pain or referred pain that is reproduced as we palpate those posterior structures if you have learned how to do palpation of those articular structures as well as when you're doing um, glide mobilization or test for your intervertebral motion. And in addition to that, they'll realize that many of those people will have deficits of the uh, deep neck flexors, multifidi, scapulothoracic musculature. And while this is not responsible for the nociception, this is something to address as needed based on the impairments that you identify. And you don't expect those individuals to have any kind of radicular signs and symptoms as part of their clinical scenario. So in terms of intervention, um, key here is again education, problem solving for posture and ergonomic or work situation, and then um, therapeutic exercise to improve range of motion. And 
there again, we have a lot of exercises that can be done. But um, one exercise that is very popular uh, with many clinicians is the exercise that you see here, where basically you have your patient using four fingers and putting those four fingers on their sternum and flex down to where they touch their fingers. And from here, rotate to the right and rotate to the left. And keep your they keep their fingers there so that every time they come back to neutral here, they know that they're still in the right amount of flexion, that they're not too far down or up. So this is why you wanna keep your finger there just as a guide. So rubbing your chin across those fingers as you rotate. And the idea is that you flex the lower cervical spine a little bit. And by flexing, that allows you to better gap the joints. And a lot of people would argue that if you have to give your patient one exercise for their range of motion, this would be the, the choice exercise, better than having them do rotation and side bending in a neutral position like we were all taught in uh, PT school, most likely. And also address muscles uh, as needed. Um, certainly there's a lot of other exercise you can do for the thoracic spine. So again, today is an overview of the, um, the concepts behind evaluation and the treatment. Um, but hopefully many of you uh, know those various skills if you, uh, for evaluation and treatment. And if you don't, it gives you some basically goals to say, okay, this is why maybe I want to learn a little bit better about the upper cervical spine or learn a little bit better about manual therapy and so on. So for that group with mobility deficit, this is also the group where if you have good manual therapy skills, this would be uh, especially uh, useful uh, because you, um, you can address the cervical spine and the thoracic spine either with mobilization technique or thrust mobilization techniques. And also include with that some soft tissue work, including trigger point dry needling that is now very popular um, to be done. So there is no really evidence one technique working better than another. So if you feel comfortable with muscle energy techniques or if you feel comfortable with mobilization versus manipulation, I think any of those techniques um, have a similar uh, evidence in terms of their ability to be helpful for patients. So I think you shouldn't feel, um, to quote uh, Gwen Jall, who, I, who uh, I admire a lot, uh, she likes to say that, um, um, that it's not how many skills you know, it's basically how good you are at a, at a limited number of skills that you can do very, very well. So, and I agree with that. It's not knowing every skill, it's to be good at, a, at some skills that uh, you feel comfortable with and using those is probably more important. So some questions that are asked is, um, key clinical question here, uh, what is best? Um, exercise, manual therapy, or both together. And there's been literature reviews on this that show that if you just do therapeutic exercise because you're not very skilled with manual therapy, you're probably gonna be okay. It's probably gonna be useful for your patient. If you have patients who don't like to do exercise and that, you know, basically they come in, you do your manual therapy, you know they're not gonna do any of their exercises, it's also probably gonna be okay you're probably gonna be fine and get some success with that. But clearly the combination of education, exercise and manual, manual therapy is best if you can do that. Another question that is often asked is, is cervical thrust manipulation superior to mobilization? And again, if you look at the literature, it says no, that there's no benefits of thrust manipulation in the cervical spine compared to mobilization techniques. So if as a therapist, you're not very comfortable with doing thrust manipulation techniques for the cervical spine because you believe there is risk or you're working with a patient that is not ideal for thrust manipulation techniques, mobilization techniques should still be able to be very good. Now, that being said, uh, there are clearly uh, a lot of clinicians that believe that thrust manipulation techniques are superior for some patients in the latest study that's been done on this was in 2012 by um, uh, Dr. Emilio Puentedera, who basically identified a subgroup of individuals who he had tremendous success uh, with manipulation techniques of their cervical spine within one or two treatment sessions. 
And those four factors are listed here. Symptoms duration less than 38 days, a site-to-site -site difference of 10 degrees in terms of rotation of the cervical spine, pain reproduction with PA uh, mobilization technique to the cervical spine, and patients when asked if they thought thrust manipulation was gonna be useful for them said yes, that they were expecting that to be useful for them. And what he found was that if people had three of those four, that his success rate was 70%, 77%. And success was defined as resolution of 50% of the symptoms and the pain. Uh, so an improvement of at least 50% in one or two treatment sessions, which is a pretty high bar to set. But he found that if you had three of the four of those, 77% of those people within one or two treatment sessions were at least 50% better. And if you had four of those, the success rate was 100%. Now you have to be careful. This, is, this study was, was done in a way that um, it's not the optimal research design. And therefore it needs to be validated. And it has not been validated yet. So keep that in the back of your mind that this may be, if you do those techniques, this may be some indicators that those would be people who would benefit. Uh, but keep in mind that we need validation of this before we feel more comfortable with promoting this anymore. And the, the third clinical question that is often asked is, is thoracic spine manipulation helpful for neck pain? And again, a lot of studies done on this. Uh, some of those studies had promoted some indicators of who would benefit the most, but those were shown not to be accurate, actually. Um, you know, follow-up studies showed that it didn't really work. And so one of the most recent studies is, is almost 10 years old now, um, has shown that um, in blue here, that if you do include thoracic spine manipulation as part of your treatment of neck pain, that you may have slightly better benefit uh, for people with mechanical neck pain. So those would be people with mechanical neck pain and that superior benefit, the, the, the biggest impact may be in that first week. And maybe that's reflective of neurophysiological effects more than biomechanical effects. But overall, the feeling was that you know, overall, there seemed to be some benefit to those people, not enormous, not as much as maybe some people are promoting, but there is benefit so that if you're skilled in doing those thoracic spine manipulation techniques, probably warrant, it's, it probably is worth doing it on those people that have mechanical neck pain. So this is our third group. This is our individuals that um, had mobility deficit, a fairly straightforward group. They will have local pain, but we referred pain to the sh posterior shoulder region. They clearly have limitation of motion, intervertebral motion when you do your manual therapy techniques. And this is a fun group to work with. If you have good manual therapy skills and good knowledge with exercises, this should be a group that um, should be uh, uh, fun to work with, and also it is a group that you expect to have good results with because um, we should be able to have the skills to improve motion when motion is limited. So that leaves us with the more complex of the groups, which is our neck pain with movement coordination impairments, which is our WAD or whiplash associate disorders group. So the symptoms we may have, and again, look at this group as a group with a tremendous spectrum in terms of severity and irritability. You'll have people that after their car accident, after their traumatic event to their neck, have just a little bit of pain and disability to people who uh, you've seen in your clinic, I'm sure, that can hardly move at all and um, are in, in very serious discomfort, very, very severe, very irritable conditions. So a very wide spectrum of people in that uh, clinical population. By and large, obviously based on the term whiplash associated disorder, we expect that uh, th there was a uh, trauma or whiplash uh, that initiated the problem. Uh, most of those individuals will have referred pain in the shoulder region, as I've explained. 
any of the structures of the cervical spine below C3 will refer pain to the shoulder region. And they may also have uh, radicular pain in the upper extremity if there is any kind of irritation, potentially swelling around any of the nerve roots. So we have a combination of referred and radicular pain occasionally. In addition, you may have all kinds of signs and indications of concussion, uh, dizziness, nausea, confusion, uh, memory losses, and those kind of things. Also expect many of those individuals to have affective distress, which means they have anxiety, they have fear, they have catastrophizing, so that um, the psychosocial issues are quite marked in that population. In terms of examination, we often expect those people to have deficits in terms of their musculature. So the deep neck flexors uh, being one of the muscle group that is most affected. We also expect them to have neck pain with range of motion. Oftentimes, the more severe they are, the earlier in the range. Uh, but typically what happens is that they have pain from early to mid range that gets worse as you go later into the range, indicating probably some of the soft tissue structures that uh, may have been injured in the process of the, um, the trauma. Also, many of those individuals will have increased tenderness to palpation. So if you do um, pressure pain threshold as part of your evaluation, those would be um, elevated in terms of scores. Also, we may expect some of those individuals to have sensory motor impairments. There's a lot of nice studies by Michelle Sterling that has shown that those individuals have excessive activation of the neck musculature when they do movement. A very good study on that was doing just arm elevation, shoulder elevation to 90 degrees. And she showed that compared to a control group, people with whiplash basically had 10 times the muscle activation of their neck musculature when they did shoulder movement, meaning that their neck musculature is hyperactive even when moving the extremities, not even just the neck region. Also proprioceptive deficits. Uh, if you have, you can use a target like this with a laser pointer, have the person aim at the target, close their eyes, move away and come back and you can measure how far or close they are from uh, the target and determine if they have proprioceptive deficits that way. Also remember to do some simple thing like balance, feet together, eyes open, eyes closed, tandem position of the feet, eyes open, eyes closed, uh, unilateral stance, same idea, to see do they have balance uh, deficits. So and also expect that they'll have pain reproduction with testing the, uh, the, the, the segments when you do your intervertebral motion testing. So as you can see, it's a very long list of, of signs and symptoms that those individuals can have, which represent the complexity of the, of the condition. So it's a very thorough exam with expectation that we can find many or all of those things on the patient. So maybe the key message today in the presentation is really that uh, we, know, we know a lot about prognosis for that population, thanks to work by Michelle Sterling and many other people. Um, we, we know a lot about prognosis and we know that 50% of those people will have a quick and early recovery. Uh, I'm not saying that all of those 50% are sent to physical therapy in many places in the world. We don't see those patients until two, three, four months after uh, the, uh, the accident, which is too bad. So we may tend to see people with more of their chronic pain um, being established already. But if we were to see people right away, we'd realize that 50% of those people should get better very quickly with 25% having moderate long-term disability and 25% with more severe long-term disability. A um, few more words generically about recovery is that um, there's a lot of studies that really show that the majority of the recovery following whiplash associated disorders occur within the first six weeks, and then maybe potentially some additional improvement for the following six weeks. So that's 12 weeks total there post-injury. And a lot of those studies have, have shown also that uh, regardless of how much or how little is done for those patients, um, beyond three months, 
it's very difficult to get additional progress. So that um, people that have had their whiplash three months or before, those are gonna be more challenging in terms of, of uh, trying to work with those people and improving them. Doesn't mean we shouldn't work with them. We can maybe improve them by a certain percentage. And the same people who did those studies that shows that beyond three months, it's hard to have large amount of improvement will tell you that they have success stories of people that they were able to completely resolve their pain in, um, even if they had had the pain for six months or more. So don't give up on those people, but just realize for yourselves that uh, don't be too frustrated if you feel like you're not getting perfect success with everybody, nobody will. Um, but hopefully a success story every once in a while and a little bit of improvement on the rest is what we may be able to aim for. So part of the evaluation for us should be to look at risk factors of chronicity in that population with the idea of do not overtreat that 50% that you know will have a quick recovery and then pay particular attention to the 50% that is at risk for moderate to severe long-term disability. And in that group, don't make the mistake of chasing which tissue is at fault. You know, is it the muscle, is it the joint, which joint it is, especially in the acute stage. Basically, um, this is not very productive. So you're gonna treat the findings. Don't try to identify the source of nociception, just treat the finding based on just management of range of motion, management of strength and so on. So we have a very nice tool today that I hope is accessible for you uh, to give us a first idea of prognosis for our patients. And um, uh, I assume the neck disability index is widely available in India. And based on the neck disability index and age, we can make a pretty good first guess as far as who has a good chance of recovery or not. So if the NDI is less than 30% and your patient is less than 35 years old, we should be able to say that this is predicted full recovery. So if the person fits this, they should have, that should be your, your part of your 50% that you expect quick recovery. Now, not every, not 50% will end up here. It's just part of the 50% will end up here. Um, will have those characteristics. And on those people, you should be very comfortable letting them know that they should recover very nicely and that they don't need extensive care, maybe a little bit of advice on exercise in the pain-free range, maybe a visit or two follow-up, maybe on a weekly basis. But they, you should expect very, um, a very clear and full recovery with those people. On the other hand, if the NDI is 40%, age is greater than 35, at this point, you'd like them to fill out the, uh, the PDS, which is the post-traumatic stress diagnostic scale. Uh, and if they have a score greater than six on that, meaning that they have also some psychosocial issues, fear, anxiety, catastrophizing, and so on, you can um, really, uh, these people fit the model where they would have moderate to severe disability. And this is a group that you really wanna pay attention to in that, uh, especially in that initial 12 weeks. And, you know, again, I think if there is one thing that um, you may want to try to do, depending on your working environment, is if you, if those people are typically not sent to you early on, try to impact, you know, try to impact uh, that aspect of management of those individuals to see can they be referred to physical therapy definitely within that 12 weeks and preferably well before the six week point because we know most progress will be in that first six weeks. So we'd like to get those people as early as we can, which is not always the case. And then we're left with a lot of people here. So you know, this will identify a portion of the people, the quick recovery, this will identify a portion of people that will have moderate to severe disability. But we also have the gray zone here where people can go in either direction. So to help us decide you know, which way those people will lean toward, we have additional tools that we can use. But before I talk about those, just realize that this um, post-traumatic stress diagnostic scale, there's a cost to use that scale. 
but it asks questions about trouble sleeping, irritability, difficulties concentrating, being overly alert and being easily startled. Um, so if you don't use the scale, you can ask those questions. But another scale that's available that asks very similar question is the impact of advanced scale. And in this scale, there is a hyper arousal scale, which is those six questions here. So instead of being six out of 15, if you use the, these questions from the impact of event scale, it's at, the threshold should be about nine out of 24. So for those people in that gray zone, we already talked about the role of the NDI. We already talked about the role of the impact of event scales. So we can add additional information. Um, if they have high pain intensity, define a six or greater out of 10, they're leaning toward the people that will have moderate to severe disability long-term. If you use the pain catastrophizing scale, if they have 20 or more on that scale, they're leaning toward people with moderate or severe long-term disability. If they have cold hyperalgesia or elevated pain pressure threshold, they also lean toward, um, that's a sign of basically uh, central sensitization. So they lean toward the people who may have a greater chance of moderate to severe disability long-term. Additional factors to consider, uh, being a female, um, reporting that you now have headaches as part of your presentation, lower level of education. If you had previous history of neck pain, also, if you have a combination now of neck pain and back pain, which is again an indicator of central sensitization, those five additional factors have also been shown to be prognostic of people with moderate to severe long-term disability from um, whiplash-associated disorder. I do realize it's a lot of factors to consider, but uh, I do think that this helps us for the people in that gray zone to say, which way are they leaning? Should I treat that person maybe a little less you know, intensely because I expect them to recover pretty well? So maybe I only treat them one time and see how they do about seven to 10 days later? Or should I be a little bit more involved right away, especially with psychosocial um, you know, type of intervention? Um, early on because they're, I'm really predicting that they are toward the side of having more chronic disability long-term. So the role of all of those was really to, to say, how do I manage those patients early on? How much attention should I uh, give to them? How much treatment should I give to them as I monitor their changes over time? What's interesting is that uh, the details of the collision itself has been shown not to be prognostic of outcomes. So uh, again, when I went to uh, physical therapy school, we were asked to really trying to understand where they hit from the front, from the side, from the back, what was the neck position and so on. And I want basically the take home message here is that there's not a lot of value to that information. And maybe the last thing we want to do with our patient is have them relive that traumatic event. So you go see the physical therapist, maybe the last thing you want to do is to try to remember in great details how your car accident occurred. So um, doesn't mean we cannot ask anything about this, but at the same time realize that it's probably not as useful as we were made to believe many years ago. And therefore, if you don't, if you want to minimize kind of the recollection of the traumatic event, maybe keep that to a minimum amount as far as the questions that you ask. So for the for the for the and people you identify as being at low risk, that will be very straightforward. Um, you expect quick recovery, provide education on remaining active. Um, provide them reassurance that they should have a nice recovery based on. Uh, all of their, uh, and you can feel comfortable letting them know that because we know what predicts recovery. And if they fit what predicts recovery, we should feel comfortable letting them know that. And then treat them with a gentle home exercise program, pain-free range with telling, uh, educating them on how to progress with that, maybe a little bit of activation of the deep neck flexor, the musculature as well. And, um, and recheck on them, recheck on them maybe once a week later, 
or maybe a second time two or three weeks later. It's been shown that having that initial session where you evaluate and provide some advice with a, at least one follow-up session is better than just giving them verbal instruction with a pamphlet or something like that. Within some emergency rooms, that's what they do. So there's value in that initial session. And this is why we should probably promote that every patient that was in a car accident that has any kind of symptoms of neck pain um, sees a PT within a few days so that we can triage them based on their prognosis and provide them with minimal treatment like in this case here or more treatment if they need. Minimize overly treating that population. Don't, that population doesn't need cervical collar and they don't need extensive treatment from us, just some guidance, education on how to progress their exercise for range of motion and strengthening for the neck. So we expect that to be about 50% of the individuals with uh, whiplash associate disorder. Um, we expect them to recover nicely within two or three months and they don't need um, extensive rehab. For, um, for people with prolonged recovery that we are on the other side of the equation here, we want to provide them good education. We want to provide them with a supervised exercise program. Again, combination of range of motion exercise and basically starting most likely with some isometric exercise for deep neck flexors, neck extensors, scapular musculature, manual therapy as we feel is warranted depending on the severity of the uh, injury. Maybe that's not really indicated with the more severe, the more acute condition, uh, maybe in the subacute condition, maybe more indicated and potentially some actual physical agents depending on perceived needs again. So this group again, uh, we're gonna need to be clever with how we select our exercises. We need to be clever how we manage them and address them to try to minimize their pain and yet promote movement and promote activation of muscles and finding ways to do that in a way that minimize their pain so that we don't promote that chronic pain situation. Um, we expect that 25% of those will go to you know, to moderate to slow recovery group. But we try to make sure that even if we may not be able to be 100% with them, that we minimize how much of that uh, disability and impairment that they have. And for the, the final group, which is more severe disability, again, we try to do our best to minimize how much residual symptoms and signs they have. And the big difference there based on your psychosocial evaluation is that this is the group that probably needs more psychosocial intervention, uh, pain education and so on, uh, something that's very popular now across the world in terms of uh, treatment approach. So as I mentioned, 50% uh, of people we should expect to recover better with just a watchful eye. And then we have people with moderate to uh, severe chronicity um, with the idea that some of those individuals will need a multimodal, multidisciplinary approach that includes addressing psychosocial components. <clears throat> Just to finish this group, the, um, this group with whiplash associated disorder um, realize that if you see those people in a chronic stage uh, greater than three months, because everything I've said so far was acute, subacute stage, which is less than three months. Those individuals at more than three months, um, we still want to provide them encouragement to try to reassure them, to try to manage their pain. And we, we wanna be telling them that there's a lot of things we can offer them. You know, at three months, we expect everything to be healed. Basically soft tissue injury should have been healed by now. So residual pain, there may be a combination of dysfunction. So I don't disregard mechanical dysfunction as still being a source of pain, but also things like central sensitization. So there's a lot of things we can offer to those people. We, we, we should not disregard addressing their impairments. So we should still address range of motion limitation. We should still address um, any deficits we see in terms of the key musculature of the neck, like 
like the deep neck flexors, the neck extensors, the scapular musculature, we should still address vestibular rehabilitation, eye hand neck coordination. Um, so if you know vestibular rehab to be in, in there, but also incorporate your uh, pain neuroscience education, your cognitive behavioral therapy and all of those features with the hope that you can make some improvement in many of those people and that occasionally that you are able to have uh, basically that success story. Um, acknowledging though that um, there's many studies that shows that those individuals once beyond three months, it's a much more of a challenge to get them better. So incorporate your manual therapy and so on with those individuals. So this, this finishes the, uh, the four groups. And what I thought I would also talk about a couple additional um, uh, thing here. I, I realized that I'm getting a little long, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about cervical hypermobility, which is not really covered in the, um, in the clinical practice guidelines. It's considered a subset of whiplash associated disorder. But the reason I bring it up is because, uh, at least to me, there seem to be a number of, especially younger women who don't have a history of trauma or whiplash, who do have hypermobility of their cervical spine and the related neck pain. So I think we have a group here that, um, unfortunately, the evidence for this was not, it's not like the people that wrote the clinical practice guidelines ignore them is that there was not the kind of evidence to speak of that group as a unique group when the clinical practice guidelines were written. So um, because our ability or our diagnostic process with them is really based on expert opinion at this point. So if we look at um, that particular group, that particular pop subpopulation, um, they, those are people that may tell us that they have intolerance. They don't tolerate static position, uh, prolonged static position. They need to move or they need to support their head with their hand. Uh, those people like self-manipulation of their cervical spine. And they also will oftentimes complain of a feeling of instability, shaking, lack of control. Um, they tend to have frequent episodes of acute pain that doesn't last necessarily very long, uh, maybe lasting just a few days. And this will happen with just moving in mid range of motion. So quick movement creates their pain. So showing that they have poor control in that early to mid range of motion. They may have a remote history of trauma from years ago, but maybe not. They tend to do well with physical activities when muscles is, are engaged. But then, especially if they've had to go to end range of motion often or position, prolonged position there, they'll, they'll, after the activities, they'll be worse. So what we see with those people is excessive range of motion when we do range of motion evaluation, excessive intervertebral motion when we assess, uh, when we assess intervertebral motion with our manual therapy techniques. And then what we also observe is just poor quality of motion of the cervical spine with shakiness, aberrant motion, kind of out of line motion and so on. And as I mentioned, hypermobility, especially of the mid cervical spine, that's typically where you see the hypermobility with uh, that population. So we also expect them to have weak um, neck flexor, deep neck flexors, as well as multifidi. And we expect them to probably fit a model of uh, having excessive uh, mobility. If you're familiar with the Byton scale, uh, they'll probably rate four or more on that Byton scale. So I think what's very important I wanted to stress today is, is that we, we need to address their posture, but including their sleeping posture with a pillow a thin pillow that can be conformed to come all the way down to the shoulder and support the neck region in addition to the head region. And just that may make a big difference. And especially in those people that tell you they get up in the morning and their neck is sore. Um, that should be, that's the worst scenario. Uh, people should feel best when they first get up in the morning, especially people with hypermobility. So um, they should feel best at that time. And if they don't, that's, that's nothing else you're gonna do is gonna be all that helpful. So this is probably one of the most important thing to do 
is to make sure they understand to support their head in a neutral position with the pillow supporting all the way to the shoulder that supports their neck. And then your, your classic uh, treatment approaches, addressing the deep neck flexors. We have different exercises that we can use for that. Addressing our multifidi, again, uh, all kind of different exercises we can do. Addressing isometric uh, exercise, again, with manual resistance. Uh, some people like to use a ball against the wall as a source of resistance, especially if you have shoulder pain or this is uncomfortable to do and using your hands is difficult. Other people, you can use a towel or a band that when now you extend your elbows, um, you work on your multifidi. You can use a band attached to the wall. You just have the person step away and step back. You can do that with side in a, in a uh, position where they're stepping, you know, side stepping for um, side bending of the cervical spine. Or if you turn the person around, now they work on their multifidi. And if you do work with isotonic exercise, I think the critical thing with that population is the first 10 to 20 degrees is to work in that early range of motion to really get that control of what we call the neutral zone, if you're familiar with these concepts by Panjabi, um, that uh, the problem with hypermobility is, is not the control at the end of range of motion, it's the control in that mid-range of motion. So don't, if you move into isotonic exercise, you know, uh, work on that first 10 degrees or so, not don't work necessarily through the full range of motion. And then do proprioceptive exercise. If you're familiar with vestibular rehab, you can have repositioning exercise with the light tracker, tracking exercise, and also just learning gentle isometric exercise to learn control of effort. So it can be a really fun population to work with. Um, most of the time, they're gonna be younger people with a lot of flexibility and um, if uh, obviously success is very much dependent on them uh, because uh, they need to build the musculature, they need to learn controlling. So it's not, they don't need you to manipulate them. It's not passive therapy. Um, but uh, um, if they buy into your, your program and you make it kind of interesting and fun through their exercises, uh, you should have a, a, good, a good deal of success with them. Um, also address the, you know, if you have a, a hypermobility and a weak neck, uh, you probably have weak shoulders as well. So address the shoulder, address the core musculature as well. Um, if you do um, manual therapy techniques, uh, look for hypermobile segment, which may be in the thoracic spine most likely. Um, finally, cervical genic dizziness is a, um, is a very challenging situation uh, with dizziness is challenging and some of the source of dizziness can be cervical genic in nature. It is included in the uh, whiplash associated disorder. And um, I realized that uh, there was no time for me to talk about that today, but uh, I thought I would leave you with a couple of references that talk about the concepts behind, behind cervical genic headaches in July, 2017 in GOSPT and also a very nice article on a case series that they basically talk about how to evaluate and treat that population in the same, uh, also in November, 2017. So those two articles can um, go a long way to make you understand that population if you're not very familiar with them. And this is some, just some of the pictures from that article showing how to do the rehabilitation and the evaluation. So, um, so, as I mentioned, not directly part of the clinical practice guideline, but something I wanted to mention because those are, are you know, interesting uh, population to work with. And uh, finally, um, two more slides here, just to show you that if you ever go to the GOSPT website and ask to access the clinical practice guidelines, which are free, by the way, you can access, download for free. You may also want to look for the perspective for patients that we wrote, which is a little bit one page information piece for patients. Um, it could be used maybe to educate physicians as well that you work with, that this is kind of a concept that we're using to treat that population. So our other healthcare providers that you see, nice little one page explanation. Um, and similarly, we also have a, a perspective for clinicians, which basically summarize everything I've said today in one page, 
with the common the categories at the top, the common symptoms, the expected examination findings, and the intervention with the strand of evidence for each of the intervention. A very nice one-page quick guide to, um, to the management of, of neck pain based on the clinical practice guidelines. If you have any desire to translate those, those some of that material, just let, let the journal or myself know. I still have contacts with the journal and uh, we typically grant permission. All you have to write is that you had permission, uh, but you're responsible for the translation. And um, if you translate it, we certainly would like a copy so we can put it on our own web page, the journal web page, and also the academy web page. Uh, with credit to you, you know, the, the, whoever translated it, uh, so that others have access to it if they come to our web page. So thank you very much, Namaste, for um, uh, being patient and through the presentation here. And uh, I believe there was. I hope there is time for questions. I think that was the plan. Oh, a very big thank you, Dr. Gee. Uh, and I, may I request the, our panelists to uh, take up the question answer session, please. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, Pavna, ma'am. Yeah, Ronika, you go ahead, then I'll talk. Yeah. Uh, sir, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I don't think anybody else could have explained it better. I mean, the all four uh, subclassifications were really, really dealt very well. Thank you so much. And I'm really sure the students are and the listeners have really understood what was meant by the cervical spine classification, which otherwise, if they would have read, it would not have been so elaborate and so clearly understood. So thank you so much for the wonderful talk and so much time you have spared for us. Thank you so much. Just a small question which I had was that, sir, how often have you find that when you do cervical spine mobilization, you have found that symptoms have increased? I mean, can we freely go and man mobilize the spine a little bit initially, or we really have to wait for the symptoms to reduce by maybe three, four days, and then go and do the cervical spine mobilization? Yes, I, I think there is no um, really short answer to that question. I, I think we have to look at different scenarios. Um, first of all would be acuteness of the condition and if there's a trauma related to the condition. In those scenarios, we have to be careful of tissue damage and mm -hmm. therefore we're going to use the concepts of pain before resistance versus pain after resistance, which are classic concepts of manual therapy. And um, in my opinion is we can always do mobilization techniques, but we have to, in those scenarios, grade one and twos would be more appropriate. Um, so that would be if there's trauma, acute condition. Then obviously we have individuals with hypermobility that if we're, you know, those would be people that I think we would not want to mobilize mm -hmm. that hypermobile segment. Again, maybe do some grade one and two, but I even think that that's probably not the most effective thing we can do with, with them. Um, and then you get people with hypomobility, and is it okay to have a little bit of soreness after you've done hypomobility, have done your manual therapy? It's perfectly okay. Typically, it clears up within one or two days. And now that we're better with randomized control, if we look at randomized control trial, and now that we're better to monitor um, side effects of our treatment, we realize that all of those randomized control trial report that, uh, yes. 30% of the people, 40% of the people who were treated with manual therapy were sore for a couple of days, regardless of using mobilization or manipulation. So I think the, the if I understood your question properly, the interpretation of is it okay to have some soreness and discomfort mm -hmm. has exactly. to be context dependent on is it acute versus chronic is there tissue damage or no tissue damage? Is it hypermobile versus hypermobile? Yes, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yes, sir. Thank you so uh, much. That's exactly what I was asking. So I mean, safely we can go ahead with the mobilization, even if there is some tissue damage. And obviously, red flags and contraindications have to be ruled out before going ahead with the mobilization. Yeah, and if you know, and again, just be very careful. If there's tissue damage, you want to do very light, and it may again not be your first choice, but. Mm -hmm. I still think that, you know, grade ones and twos are, are okay. Um, just trying to maybe mobilize some of the maybe swelling or fluid in the area. You just have to have good skills so that you're not overly stressing the system. And those are the people where I would like them to be better after I'm done than sore, right? Because if yes. there is any kind of acuteness or grade one and twos is to decrease their pain, not to make it worse. So this is where you can give yourself some feedback with those. Uh, if Thank I just, so if Thank I may just so interrupt for a second, uh, mm -hmm. sir, if you can uh, stop the share screen, our viewers oh, can sure. see all of us uh, on full screen. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Simon, this was an excellent and very informative session. The subclassification definitely will help all our viewers to manage the patients clinically in a better way. Uh, what I want to ask you is that your second classification of neck pain with radicular, uh, uh, radicular pain, uh, would you refer these patients before to the orthopedic surgeon, if they came to you as direct access or first contact before starting the treatment, or would you start the treatment and the necessary precautions that you would take and then refer? Yeah, I, I think um, that's an excellent question. Again, the um, <clears throat> I would uh, similar to the previous question, I, I would reply based on severity of the condition. So if you have somebody coming in and they have minimal amount of pain or tingling and so on, um, I don't think this is somebody that I feel compelled to send to a physician for evaluation. But as soon as somebody has clear sensory loss and clear motor loss, or what I mean loss here is deficits, not completely gone, obviously. Um, but uh, I think when you start seeing those more severe neurological signs and signs where you, you attest that there is some sensory deficit, some motor deficit, some deep tendon reflex deficit. I think it's important to establish that relationship with the physician. And depending on how you work with physician, that at least they see the patient and there's this, there's a team approach to making decision as far as follow-up studies and also it also helped putting the person in, in, in the system so that if they do need surgery, um, things are not delayed. There's a lot of debate as far as if, when is surgery needed with that population too. I don't have the clear answer on that. I, you know, I think there's a lot of change. That, well, some people say as soon as you have motor loss, you need surgery. Some other people say no. So I, I, to my knowledge, I don't know what the exact guideline that prompt surgery is, except that the worse the neurological signs, the more likely that should prompt um, the surgical intervention. So, you know, very, very light, mild symptoms. I don't feel compelled with that, um, especially, but the more severe the condition, I think it's a good thing to do. Uh, thank you, sir. Another question I have is that when we have patients with mobility deficits, very often they have excess mobility. So how do you talk about, uh, how do you balance between the mobilizations or manipulations for these patients? This is for my people, experience. That is what I have seen. A lot of them have hypermobility. At but they have hypomobility of the neck or they have yes. mobility deficit when with the neck. Yes. Yeah. I think I would be, <clears throat> the first thing I would say on, on this is to be a little bit careful when you do, let's say you do a range of motion evaluation of the neck 
in a weight-bearing position with your shoulders down, you know, the limited motion that is due to musculature may hide the fact that underneath those muscles, there may be excessive mobility of the cervical spine because of tones and so on. So I think we're fooled sometimes to think people have hypomobility in their cervical spine because when we look at them in a weight-bearing position with their shoulders down, they look like they're a little bit limited with their range of motion. And a couple tricks there would be to you support their shoulders. And then you may realize this dramatic change in their range of motion now that exposes the fact that they're moving a lot more than you thought. Or when you put them supine and now you do passive range of motion, you see this dramatic increase in their range of motion. You realize that this first impression of hypomobility or reduced range of motion it was more about either muscle guarding or muscle tightness that the articular structures themselves are actually very mobile. And then your next step is obviously to assess with your hands um, the intervertebral motion itself to determine is this, is this really hypomobility or hypermobility. So that's kind of the generic answer. The more detailed answer is that it is not unusual to have hypomobility of these upper cervical spine because of forward head posture often time. And it's also not unusual to have hypomobility of the upper thoracic region. So the idea is that even with people with uh, systemic hypermobility, you may have specific joints that are hypomobile. And that is really a skillful thing to do for the therapist to go and make that decision. Okay, this one is moving too much. This one is not moving enough. And it, the, also the really uh, difficult skill is to try to really target that joint that's moving, that needs to be stretched without overstressing the other joints. And this is where it's really a very skillful, you need skill to do that because it's really being able to differentiate which one's moving too much, which one's moving enough, not enough. But, but I, I do think that in many, many scenarios is we get fooled to look at the range of motion, not realizing that they're protecting themselves with their musculature. And, and when we eliminate that, we realize they're actually moving more than we, we want. I had that exact, I had that exact student a year, uh, two years ago, coming to see me, my neck is stiff, my neck is stiff, I keep stretching my neck and I look at her and I'm like, no, your neck is, moving way too much. I mean, it's, uh, you have more than enough flexibility. And she was one of those chronic uh, self manipulators. She would manipulate her neck all the time. And my neck is stiff and I lay her down and I get more than 90 degrees of rotation with her neck. And I just needed to show to her that she was not hypomobile. And, and we started working on her musculature and she responded very, very well uh, to that. So I'm, so that's um, kind of the two scenarios here that I, I would look at for that population. Thank you, Dr. Simming. Anything else? Anybody else? Ronika, you want to go ahead or Apuru wants to ask anything more? No, ma'am. I think uh, Dr. Gee had already given a very, very elaborative and detailed information on what the cervical spine classification clinical presentation and what should we be more careful as physiotherapists when I think we are handling the cervical spine. So uh, on behalf of Physio TV, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Guy Simini for his precious time for giving us such an elaborative session on understanding the cervical spine. I would also like to thank Dr. Bhavna Matre, ma'am, Professor, uh, School of Physiotherapy, GS Medical College, Mumbai, Dr. Ronika Agarwal, Principal of M.A. Rangunwala College of Physiotherapy, Pune, for their extreme contribution and for their expert inputs. On behalf of Physio TV, I would also like to thank our team, Dr. Ashok Sham, Mr. Rahul Chobe, Dr. Parag Sancheti, Mrs. Manisha Sangvi, Dr. Nilima Bedekar, who have all contributed towards this session and have really worked out, Dr. Manish and Dr. Neeraj for their technical support. Uh, I wish all of you a very wonderful day ahead. And on behalf of Physio TV, I wish you all a very good day. Have a good time. Thank you so much. I'll be ending this session. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir. Thank you so much. It was really Thank an enlightening session. Thank you, sir. It was
It was my pleasure. This was really nice to, uh, to participate in. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Hope to see all Namaste. of you all Namaste. very soon. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you Apur. Thank you, ma'am. I'm ending the session. Yeah.